Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for 292 Baby Educational Videos, Support for Parents and Caregivers of Infants. I would like you to know that all of the experts featured in our video series have given freely of their time and all are from the early childhood community of Greater Rochester. On behalf of everyone affiliated with the 292 Baby Project, we wish you the very best of luck with your children. 292 Baby is a community collaboration administered by Monroe Community College. And our show today is all about uh, motor skill mania. And our special guest is Wendy Lane, who's a child life specialist from uh, Strong Children's Hospital. And Wendy, I just want to thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. It's exciting to come talk about one-year-olds. So. Uh, one-year-olds. A um, couple questions right off the bat. What is a child life specialist? Uh, a child life specialist, um, we work up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. and. We focus on the emotional and the developmental needs of the children in the hospital. Okay. So from anywhere from ages zero mm -hmm. to ages 18, we help them out both emotionally but also developmentally to make sure they're progressing mm -hmm. the way that they should. So you must have a real personal love of that particular age bracket, do you? Just, I think I have a love for the earlier ages just because there's just so much that they're mm -hmm. learning and doing and there's so much that we can learn from them mm -hmm. as, as in the way as how they explore things. So. I know when I was younger I would have never thought that a one-year-old or a six-month-old that, that their brain was exploding as much as I realize now and how much is going on for them and just how important that stage really is. Um, second question, yes. when you talk about motor skill mania, what do you actually mean by motor skill? Motor skill is, is kind of our lingo way of saying the way they move about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they have been brought up growing side by side in the early ages next to their parent mm -hmm. and feeling like their parent and them are one. Mm -hmm. And then when they start getting a little bit older, they start realizing, wow, this is my body. These mm -hmm. are my hands. These mm -hmm. are my feet. And I'm going to take them and find out what everything else is <laughs> yeah. around, in the, around the environment and, and explore it. Yeah. So that's what we talk about motor mania. It's taking that body and moving it about. So they get a sense of control over it and they have a... Yeah, they're, they're learning. They're learning their independence. They're learning how to mm -hmm. how to manipulate and move things around in the world and pick things up and look at it and mm -hmm. stare at it and touch it and smell it and mm -hmm. all sorts of things. So that's all natural, isn't it? That they want to, if they're sitting there at the table and they've got mashed potatoes, that they want to feel it and yeah. rub it on them right. and all if that. Right. You and I want to take a fork and kind of yeah. eat yeah. it. They want to take it and just smoosh it all yeah. over their plate and, and play with it and stick it on their mouth mm. and, you know, smell it and do whatever they can because it's yeah. just, it's a, it's a touch, it's a taste, it's, a, yeah. it's an excitement to them. Is it, is it good to let them do that? It's wonderful to let them do that. I know the first, your first instinct is to want to wipe off the, yeah. wipe off the tray. Um, but you should allow them an opportunity to, up to a point. I yeah. mean, you have to give them, I hate to say the word limits, because you don't want to give a little kid limits, but mm -hmm. you have to give them um, a little bit of, you have to have some control over that. Mm -hmm. But um, they need the opportunity to do that. Let them get it on their face. Let <laughs> them, you know, explore what it's like within the boundaries of, of what's safe within the boundaries of um, being able to have them move on to the next step of learning rules a mm -hmm. little bit. I remember with my kids on their first birthday, it was kind of a tradition in our family that we'd just put a piece of chocolate cake in front of them and then just let them go, you know, and they would wear the cake by the time they were done with it and it would just be from the, from the high chair right straight to the shower. We have tons of pictures of that. Oh, too. we do? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. Of it all over, yeah. everybody. Which I threaten the kids to show on their first dates there when they go. bring there them home, go. you know. They're both teenagers now, and like, oh, hope dad doesn't do that. Um, Okay, the child's one years old, they're just a bundle of energy, they want to explore. Um, that's got to just wear parents out. It's, it's probably the most <laughs> time where parents, more, parents have to always be on the go with them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, a parent wants to get their lunch together, get their dinner together, and yet at the same time they have to keep an eye as to where did, where did he or she go, mm -hmm. and have to kind of uh, create an environment that allows the child to explore, but also at the same time is safe for yeah. them to do. And, and it's just, it's always running after, and, yeah. and we say that, and we saw a little child here earlier, and mm -hmm. the mom's just chasing after him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And we should let the viewing audience know that this child that we he was running around earlier is the one that's coming on in the second half of the show when we look at some of the toys that you've brought in some of the ways. Um, well, so kids exploring, they naturally learn from, from the exploration. But are there other activities that parents can do that would encourage learning in, in the sense of play? It, just helping to en enrich their environment, helping them to um, 
explore. I mean, if you're in the kitchen with them, you know, and there you have a, a cabinet that's fairly safe and it's got maybe a pots and a, and, a, and a wooden spoon or something like that where they can go in and they can explore, that's okay. I mean, there's certain things you obviously want to keep them safe around, mm -hmm. but you also have to give them an opportunity to explore because otherwise you're going to find other, they're, they're going to always find something, mm -hmm. whether, whether they're outside in the backyard um, picking up the rocks and looking underneath it mm -hmm. or, or, you know, going over and grabbing that flower you didn't want them to pluck off and, and that mm -hmm. kind of a thing. They need to explore and so you have to provide them with mm -hmm. an with an environment where they can do that. But, and so parents have to learn the steps that they have to take to make sure that the things in the environment mm -hmm. are things that are going to help them to build their skills or learn how to do the, the next thing. Mm -hmm. And so they can move on to sitting down with a hardcover book and looking at pictures and that kind of thing. I can remember um, my son, and he's probably a year old, is, is the same age as um, um, Jack is, who's coming on here in a little bit. And we would go out and just for a couple of hours, just turn over a big rock and you know there'd be 50 potato bugs and the cre creepy crawlers and everything. And my sons, it would be like discovering treasure, you know, and uh, just touching the, the potato bugs and they'd crawl right up. And he would start telling me about this, even though he, no words, just, I would, you know, and we'd have a conversation about it. it, it it's even, you know, up, up here in the Rochester area, you know, we're kind of stay dormant for the winter time. Mm -hmm. So now springtime's coming, and for those people who have now one-year-olds, now these children can go outside and they're on their feet and they're on their feet and they can go and they can do these kind of things. So it's going to be their first time experiencing that little ant crawling along. Yeah. It's going to be their first, you know, so, so like what you were saying, it's going to be their first time seeing the worm come out of the ground and <laughs> yeah. wanting to go over and pick that up. Yeah. And we should be allowing them to do that. We need to watch over them while they're doing that. But, yeah. but giving them those things is just a wonderful, their, their brain is just going and absorbing all the information from their touching and their yeah. looking and going on to the next thing. Would it be fair to say, just the conclusion I'm drawing from what you're saying, that if the child actually experiences it, as opposed to being told about it, oh. that that's... They almost, at that age, need to experience mm -hmm. it. Um, being told about it isn't as much of an... Absor there, a, that child, a one-year-old, it's the present, it's the here, it's the now, it's what I see, it's what I feel, it's what I touch, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's also what I hear, but it's, it's about the things that, that are in their environment. Mm -hmm. So. You know, sitting down, I think reading a book is fantastic, and they need to read a book, but they need to experience it. Mm -hmm. What if you tie the book into the experience? That's the best part. Yeah. That's the best part. Yeah. Tying those books into, um, and, and then going and doing those kind of things the next day. Or, you know, if the book's about, you know, putting on their clothes, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. It's helping them to build that skill. Yeah. When my kids were little, um, they'd get so into playing and so into, I don't know. It's the excitement of being one that going to bed was tough. And uh, any clues about or advice about bedtime things? Well, they, they just want to keep going. There is no stopping. And when they stop, I don't know if you, we call it crash and burn sometimes. <laughs> you know, they're just, their motor keeps going and then they run out of the energy. Are you talking the parents or the child? Yeah, well, that's exactly. It is the parent and the child yeah. that does that. Um, but what we need, I, what parents need to do is they need to s set, um, a standard mm -hmm. um, every night. What are you going to do? Is it, um, I mean, it doesn't, it, parents can take turns or people can take turns, but it needs to have a set structure that, you know, we take this step, um, you know, whether it's having the, having the one-year-old, you know, if you have two sets of pajamas, does he point to that one or does he point to that mm -hmm. one? He gets the choice of doing that, that's mm -hmm. good. And then it's maybe we try to encourage reading time at nighttime and pick that book or that book and, mm -hmm. you know, he'll pick that one and, and then sit down with them and, and read to them and, and try to have a quiet time mm -hmm. before they go to bed. Yeah. So it, because otherwise, you know, saying, okay, it's time for bed, you're not going to get them in that bed right yeah. away. You, yeah. You've got to work them down. you got to work them down to that point. Well, one of the things you just said, too, is that um, if you give them a choice, at one year old, they're not talking. But if they point, they're communicating. And that gives them a whole sense of controlling their environment. And, and gives them a sense that they're involved in the going to bed stage, yeah. which yeah. is also very good, too. Yeah. Um, I remember um, when I learned the strategy of giving them a choice of two things. You know, and I would pick the two things, of course. You know, and, but, but they still felt that they had a sense of control with that. And um, um, they were satisfied with that. Yes, that's my choice, and so I'm, you know, I'm happy to. It's part, it's part of their independence. Mm -hmm. It's saying, wow, I can make that choice. I can make that decision. And we're giving them a safe opportunity to make that. Yeah, yeah. 
when they're crying and don't want to leave you and they're clingy. Um, this is the part where they realize, now that they've realized, okay, I'm not part of that, I'm not right next to my mother, I am independent, I am my person, mm -hmm. they also start realizing that when they, they, they start realizing a little bit of fear that, oh my goodness, I'm now by myself, what happened to that mother? Yeah. And they want to go back to that mother or that father or that care provider that they have. Mm -hmm. And so we call it separating. Yeah. And that's, that's a difficult thing for them to do. And they start really, this is when it's hard to get a babysitter yeah. a lot of the times yeah. because the child doesn't, they're starting to understand that this is not a person I typically play with or I, you know, I feel comfortable with. And uh -huh. so they've just started recognizing that. Yeah. And uh, so it, it's a tricky time. And um, parents need to, if they say they're getting a babysitter for the first time, that mm -hmm. babysitter needs to warm up, or what we call warm up with the child. And what that means is they need to get down and play with them mm -hmm. or, or have something that, that, that they can interact with that child with and have that child feel comfortable and say, oh, okay, you're okay type of person. Maybe I can stay here with you. Yeah. They'll always have that fear and, and the parents have to reassure that I'm coming back. And that's what we always say to parents. You know, don't just run away. Yeah. Please let your child know that you're leaving because that needs to show, you need to show the reality that you're going to be leaving, mm -hmm. but that you're coming back. And reassurance, see, I came back. Yeah, yeah. So, and the more that happens, then they can predict it. So, okay. We're going to take a break in just a minute here. Um, but before we go to break, you just took me back years to when my, my daughter, especially, um, we had a whole routine at bedtime. And if I were in a hurry, like, oh, I wanted to get down and watch a show or something, she'd know that. Yeah. You know, and I couldn't cut it. The routine itself would take probably 45 minutes, where reading was part of it. Right. You know, and I, I drew the conclusion and learned that I should never use reading as a, they should always get read to whether they were doing what I wanted to or not. That shouldn't be a tool. But then we would get in the rocker for maybe 10 minutes and she would, at one year old, she would point to the crib when she was ready. Wow. And then we'd get up and stand by the crib and um, I would just, you know, rock her a little bit and then she'd point into the crib. We could, I couldn't just take her and set her in. And then she was in there and then it would just be wiping the side of her head just and just, you know, whispering things to her that so didn't even okay. make much sense. Yeah. yeah. And once that happened, she was out. And yeah. sometimes when you put them in the crib and they stand up, mm -hmm. at the younger age of the one, they, they need that help to get down. Because a lot yeah. of the times when they start learning to stand up, yeah. they forget, oh my gosh, I'm up here, now how do I get down there? So yeah. they, they need also the comfort to lay down. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, it's... Okay. Okay, we're going we're gonna to go to break here, and when we come back... Uh, we're going to do something a little unusual here. We're going to take a chance. This is live TV. We're taking a chance anyways. But we're going to have 16-month-old uh, Jack come on with his, um, um, with his mom, Jill. And we are going to look at some of the toys that uh, you're going to tell us about and some of the things that will be very good for uh, um, children to learn with and to, just to have fun with and learn while they're having fun. So we'll be back in just a moment. And back to Parent Talk. And Parent Talk is an unusual TV show in that we're all about babies and we're all about early childhood. And that's exactly what we have here in the second half of today's show. And um, we're with Wendy Lane, who's a child life specialist at Strong Children's Hospital. And Wendy is um, we're dealing with motor skill mania and children learning in that first year, first year of life. Our focus is on one-year-olds today. And uh, Wendy, can you introduce our, our special guest today? Yeah, this is actually Jack. And Jack belongs to his mother, Jill, <laughs> who actually I, I work with up at the hospital. Thank you. And <laughs> Jack is... 16 months old, aren't you? And um, we were just going to have him here and, and show us some of the things. And he already was showing us how to stack up these, these cups. And he was learning how to bang them together. But we just thought we'd show how some of these toys help in enhancing their, their growth and their learning, most importantly. And as you notice, he's already turning to mom to make sure that she's there um, because we are strangers to him. And uh, it's nice to have her in the background to be with us. He's too cute, though, i got to say. Yeah, he, yeah, <laughs> he is. He is. Now, and he's, right now, what is he playing with here? Right now, he's just learning the ins, <laughs> the ins and the outs, is what we say. <laughs> no and he's just learning how to take things and put them in. He's trying to figure out how to put things on top of each other. Sometimes we just make it fun and let it pile up and have them bang it over even, yep. which is a fun thing to do. And this is just a series of cups that fit inside each other. That's all it is. Yeah. It's a yeah. sim simple little thing. It could be your measuring cups that you have in your kitchen type of a thing. Like and, it, it, oh, sorry, and it's a fun it's a fun thing to do. <gasps> what happened there? <laughs> oh. <laughs> now my kids love these in the bathtub because they would fill them with water and pour <laughs> from one to the other. And uh, um, actually, they went well beyond age one with them. 
Yeah, they, you know. they do. And you know what? That's the fun part about stacking cups. It's, yeah. You can do all sorts of things. Actually, I used them to rinse my child's oh, yeah, hair right, with sure, in the sure. bathtub. Yeah. So you could do all sorts of things with them. And I think, you know, sometimes we use them to, to store some of your, your Cheerios or something like that in them as well. Yeah. But, um, but they're fun things to do. And they can play with them in the sandbox or they can play with them outside. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty harmless. You can play with them in the car, too, even if they... So there might even be some, I mean, play is play, but it might even be incidental that they're learning because weren't you telling me that uh, some of those cups, one is half the size of the other in terms yeah. of volume and <laughs> half the size again? Yes. Yeah, so the, the fun thing about these particular cups is they go by numbers. Mm -hmm. And say you pick up number, number four and number three, and obviously he's way too young for this. Pick up four and number three. You fill these up with water, they should equal number seven. And isn't that fun oh, for yeah. people who yeah. are school teachers? Yeah, right. They can have a lot of fun with that. Yeah. They explore mm -hmm. through not only manipulating with their hands, but they explore through tasting things, yeah. as he is going to do. <laughs> and um, as you notice, that's not going to make it all the way in the mouth, and that's, that's yeah. a good toy to have. Yes. The ones that don't make it in, because at this age, things go in the mouth. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. And that would be a huge safety issue, wouldn't it? Right, right. But, but that's, it's just exploring. Yeah. And that's, you know, they're going to explore that yeah. way. None of these actually would fit. Oh, we have a new toy now. Well, he said, okay, I saw something else, so let me get to that. Because as you notice, there he is. He's already saying, okay, what else you got out there in that environment? Now, I thought he might have been turning to go to, go to mom. Like, oh, I'm done with that toy. I'm ready to move on. I think he saw the colors over there. Oh, okay. <laughs> but as soon as he saw that, that got his attention. Yeah. And, and sometimes you don't want to, you know, give them too, too much. Because then yeah. they're going to start getting a little frustrated. Mm -hmm. or. Uh, or they're not going to know how to sit down with one thing at a time. He's being fabulous and wonderful. Yeah. He's not showing me the motor mania, which is okay because around this environment, it's yeah. probably he had his motor mania earlier when he ran <laughs> yeah. around this whole building, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, but he's showing you his, what we call, you said motor, mo fine motor skills. He's mm -hmm. showing us his hands. Look at what he just did. I know. It. It's and, and then you should reinforce them. Say, yay! You did a good job. <laughs> and from then he's looking for yes, the rewards. Did. Like, that yes. was really good. Look you did a I very nice do. job. And you know what? If you didn't clap, he'd mm -hmm. turn to you and look at you like, uh, uh, yeah. okay, yeah. Now, now you can clap. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, oh, I should have clapped, yes. Now, as he's putting them on, from a language point of view, can you describe for him what he's doing? You're, oh, I see you're putting them back on. And, uh, it, it, good point to have. You, you should talk about, you can either use the colors if you like. Mm -hmm. I mean, say, oh, where does the red one go? Mm -hmm. Where does the, the, the blue one go? I'm just going to help him here so he doesn't have to get up and run away. Oh, no, um, he's going to explore. He's going to see if those cups will go on the... Yes. And he notices different shapes and different sizes. But it is nice. You can talk about those things if you incorporate the, co mm -hmm. the colors in. Sure. He's learning a language right oh, yeah. now. Yeah. He should be, he's probably saying more than four or five words that are clear mm -hmm. to understand. Yeah. Um, but amazing, by the end of a year, almost getting into two years, mm -hmm. up to 20 to 40 type words they can start. I mean, that, yeah. so the words are just... Yeah. He's being awful quiet right yeah. now, but he's doing good. This might even be, if this is red, and that's red, and that's red, that he might be able to see the red all together there. He's like, yeah, but I like the toy better. <laughs> <laughs> Should we try something different? Now, another thing that is fun, when you, you know, you talked about um, with, with parents saying mm -hmm. goodbye, yeah. how difficult that is. Yep. One thing that's fun sometimes to teach with them mm -hmm. is peekaboo. Um, or, or hide and seek. Mm -hmm. But if we took something like this, hey Jack, hey Jack. Where'd and you we go? went, oh, peekaboo. <laughs> <laughs> we could do that. Start with yourself, and then if he wants, you can put it over here and say, <laughs> where's, hey, Jack? where's Jack? <laughs> Where are you? <gasps> peekaboo. <laughs> and that's a fun way of learning here, gone, mm -hmm. and then you reappear again. And yep. that's a nice thing to show. Sometimes the other things we do is we'll take an object and we'll take this object and, and we'll hide it. He's a little occupied with other things right now, but if you hide it, mm -hmm. see if he goes and seeks and tries to find it. Yep. And he'll go and he'll find it. And that's a learning process. It's realizing something's gone, but I'm going to figure out where it went to. Yep. And then he'll come and he'll find it. Yeah. What I'm really seeing, too, is that you are developing language with this as well. I mean, it, where is this? You're asking the question yep. and you're answering the question and showing and uh, that interaction with the child all the time. Um, you know, from a, in, a, in a larger sense, you're almost helping him become a, a good reader yeah. because language foundation for reading. And, and the nice thing is, is we're giving him toys. Yeah. And we're saying, you can do this. Yeah. This is a fun thing. Instead of saying, 
no, 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 you know, mm -hmm. what do they say the first words is that they learn? Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, it, this is this is not putting those limits on mm -hmm. him. This is allowing him. So so having having toys. I I everything I do up at the hospital is with toys yeah. because it's just their way of learning. It's their way of exploring, um, and it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So. Now, and this is motor skills. I mean, this is more fine motor skills. This is right. This is the what we say by fine is more the hands. Yeah. He's doing the hands, and their hands are incredible at this stage because. I mean, right now we're showing big things, but mm -hmm. when he's sitting there eating, I'm sure he takes the little Cheerio or the little breakfast cereal and he can, he, they start off kind of raking it in the beginning and then now he's getting into, we call it pincer, mm -hmm. and he goes right for the fingers and he picks that oh, little yeah. thing up yeah. and it goes right into the mouth. Yeah. Um, and that's when he starts picking up all the little screws that you might have dropped and <laughs> yeah. saying, ah, oh, daddy, yeah. look what you dropped, yeah. you know? And he'll pick those things up. And then it brings up the safety issue again. And, and that brings up to, the safety issue. Yeah. He's going to find, you know, all those things you drop. That penny you, you pulled mm -hmm. out of your pocket, you dropped on the floor, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. They find them. Yeah. You know? And it, of course. And, it, and, right and then the right mouth, there, yeah. it's going to be the exploring. And yeah. where's he going to explore? Yeah. He'll explore to his mouth. Hmm. Yeah. Is it food? I'll taste it. No, it's not. Maybe I'll, you know, do something else with it. Yeah. So. This is fun. He's learning ins and outs. If yeah. you notice, he's learning how to put things on. And this is a very fun time where they're learning to put everything in the buckets. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen once we get to the full potential part Well, he's going to make it work. <laughs> yeah. But, and, and you know, <laughs> well, we, we talk about exhausting parents, but here he is sitting here. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I think also because he just had a half an hour yeah. of motor mania <laughs> running around. Mom and just so, had a half hour of motor mania too, <laughs> so I think. this is a nice time where, where a parent can kind of sit down and have the safe yeah. little environment and yeah. sit down and do that kind of thing and he can have fun. Yeah. Okay. What do you think, Jack? He's, he's usually, he's, I think he's kind of verbal. I heard you on the telephone last mm -hmm. night, but you're not saying a word today, huh? <laughs> Say, I'm too busy. Yeah. We He's gonna you know see. What? He's gonna play a game with you now. It's you notice this. <laughs> hey. Are you sure Hi. <laughs> Would you like to bring that up again? Um, at you this know, age, they understand a lot, don't they? They do. They're understanding a lot, and they're they're picking up a lot of the words. And and listen to the various the various sounds that he starts making. And yeah. one thing I didn't point out is how do you encourage this? Yeah. And people say, I'm crazy, because they go into the playroom and they'll see me and I'll be like, uh-oh, and bubba dubba 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 doo yeah. and you start talking that, you know, there's, there's a commercial out there that's got this mom that talks baby talk. But it's a good thing to do because it encourages their, it encourages their language skills. Yeah. And um, they will um, repeat that. And a lot of times they like to imitate what you say. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they like to imitate what you do, too. So we have to have them learn by our examples as well. So we need to be kind of careful on, on what we're doing because so they're going to follow and they're going to watch everything that their mommy does. Mm -hmm. Well, look at him. He's getting that little teeny fingers in there yeah. and he's grabbing those, those Cheerios. Uh -huh. oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, listen, we're just going to have to wrap it up here and I just want to thank you, Joe, for bringing sure. Jack and he was just delightful and just too cute for words. So thanks again. And Wendy, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you for and, having um, me. This was wonderful and there just is so much going on in those little brains that it's just, it's just amazing. It's wonderful to see. Yeah. So. Thanks for staying tuned, everyone. I'm Jim Coffey. Again, this is a very short production in the Rochester Parent Network. We're going to deal with one specific issue and that is lead and iron in our children and the effects that it has. And we've got Dr. Neil Herendine, the director of the pediatric practice at the Golisano Children's Hospital. And Neil, again, thanks for coming back. Um, the issue of lead and iron, that seems to surface recently. Yeah, the problem of lead poisoning is a definite is issue in Rochester because we do have many older homes with lots of renovations. And, and the lead that's in the paints and the, in the environment can last for 50, 60, 70 years. So we're still paying for the things that were going on a long time ago. And the question nutritionally, what is the effect of lead and what does that do to nutritional things coming through the intestine? So iron is another metal, just like lead is a metal, and they actually compete for how they're able to, to come through the intestinal wall and into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So if you have a high lead level in your bloodstream and you eat a bunch of iron-rich containing formulas, that lead won't allow the iron to bind across to get into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So high lead levels often cause low iron levels. Mm -hmm. And we know from a lot of other studies about iron deficiency, anemia, and iron deficiency in general that 
kids need iron, not just to make red blood cells, but there's nutritional needs of the brain that require iron as well. So as kids are creating new synapses, new growing brain neurons, they need iron to function properly. Mm -hmm. So if you have the problem of high lead levels, that's one problem. If you compound that with low iron levels and you're anemic, you just put double the insult. And that's where we really try to put the message out that any child that you're worried about having increased lead, even low levels of 9, 10, 11, trying to make sure that we also don't add to that insult by having iron deficiency anemia. Mm -hmm. It's very important to get iron-containing formulas and iron-rich products. And for many kids, it may just be taking a multivitamin mm -hmm. or an iron supplement to make sure they get what they need. Because the iron-containing foods, we're talking spinach, green leafy vegetables, meats, red meats in particular, and those aren't the favorite foods of most 12 to 15 month olds. And the under two year olds are kind of some of our highest risk of a attaining a lead level that's too high. Mm -hmm. So our most at risk population is probably also the same kids that are the least likely to get enough iron in their diet. Mm -hmm. And the formulas all contain iron, breast milk has enough iron. So it's really after they come off formula and before they start eating a lot of red meats, that one to three year old range that we may need to pay a little more attention to getting enough iron into their diet. Mm -hmm. This whole lead problem, it's almost like poisoning them right out of the box. You know, they're just, um, they're getting hit with a poison immediately. And we're learning much more about the effects of lead. Even 15 years ago when I was training mm -hmm. in pediatrics, the worrisome lead levels were up in the 30s and higher. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of research, in particular, Dr. Michael Weitzman here at Rochester, Bruce Lamphere, who trained here and then moved on to St. Louis, are really leading the nation's campaign to making both politicians and doctors aware that these low lead levels can have significant cognitive effects, decreasing school performance, decreasing your IQ. Mm -hmm. So the difference of having a lead level of five versus 15 may be as many as five IQ points mm -hmm. if you allow that exposure to continue. Yep. And does that not count how bad it is the lead prevents the iron intake. And then adding iron deficiency mm -hmm. is probably an, another big factor that makes it even worse. Okay. So the message is let's get the lead out first, mm -hmm. but if you do have low levels of lead, mm -hmm. let's get the iron content in and make sure you're not iron deficient on top of that. Okay. I think you've hit it when you say let's get the lead out. Absolutely. That was more than one meaning there. Neil Herney, thanks so much. And again, thank you for joining us on Parent Talk. I'm Jim Coffey. Take care. 292 Baby is a community collaboration of many community partners and it's administered by Monroe Community College. What you're seeing is a list of those who are supporting or have supported the efforts of 292 Baby to reach out to help support parents and caregivers of infants. We would like to thank each of these contributors for their own unique contribution to this effort. Hi, I'm Dr. Lynn babcock Pello. I'm one of the doctors at the Dallas Army Children's Hospital at Strong. I am here today representing the Injury Free Coalition for Kids, whose main mission is to reduce injuries in Monroe County and Rochester area. When you put your child into the crib itself, um, there's a back to sleep campaign, and what that means is to actually put your child placed to sleep on their back. This decreases, once again, the risk of suffocation or SIDS, which is also known as sudden infant death. So the American Academy of Pediatrics and all pediatricians recommend that you try and put your child back um, on his or her back to go to sleep. The other thing is, is that all toys, when a child, for example, any of these, when a child goes to sleep, all these toys should probably be removed from their crib, and they should not be actually sleeping with any of these. At any point in time, these could actually either suffocate the child or the child could choke on some of these things. Most of these are of large enough size that the child should not choke on it, but it's probably best to remove all sorts of objects from the child's crib when they're actually sleeping. Good morning, sunshine. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Baby's brains don't grow she'll by themselves. Be round the mountain when she but when you comes. sing to your baby, she'll be coming round the mountain. talk she'll to your baby, round the mountain. and play with your baby, round the mountain when she his brain cells learn to grow. We will all come out so sing to your baby, talk to your baby, play with your baby. <laughs>